Okay, it is seven o'clock now, so I suppose we can get started. As I did mention a few minutes ago, people were having problems with load shedding, specifically Mr. Telemarcus, who was supposed to be giving our lesson today. So we unfortunately will have to deal with me instead. And I don't think we'll get too many more people than we have here, because I think a lot of people will be affected by the load shedding. So hey, we'll make do with what we've got. So we're going to be talking about hanging pawns today, which okay, I think is an interesting topic. Let me just share my screen. I think this is the right screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have a position of hanging pawns. Let me just hide the notation on the side here. Black obviously has the D and C pawn hanging. Can somebody tell me what are some strengths associated with the hanging pawns? Uh, isn't one of the strengths if they start rolling and getting forward, they get stronger? Yeah, definitely. Okay, because it's a promotion they get, yeah. No, that's all your pawns in general. Specifically, okay, if you can push them and you get <laughs> fast pawns and you just start pushing them out the board and you get two queens. But yeah, the idea, if you can push them, you gain a space advantage and that can lead to a lot of dynamic possibilities. You can see attack on the king's side, maybe even targeting queen side weaknesses. And there's a lot of ideas. This game we're looking at here is Karshnoi playing against Karpov, which, okay, I don't think there's two better people you could pick to analyze chess games of so yeah i think Kopov's playing black here yeah, the positional king i do have some lists here on the side here of some of the strengths of the hanging pawns you get good control of the center obviously we do have these two pawns they're controlling a lot of squares right which can be very nice you have the opportunity to build up and regroup forces behind the hanging pawns the space advantage which was kind of mentioned by rowan earlier if you have more space, there's more squares for your pieces, you can get more of an attack going. And then you have their mobility, which is the fact that at the correct moment, that's important to note at the correct moment, they can advance and that can lead to a lot of possibilities for black. So in this position, Karpov elected to play d4, which I guess is obviously something that does need to be calculated. It does open up his light squared bishop, which is very nice for him and part of his long-term plan however i'm good at counting so i count one two three four five white pieces attacking that and only one two three defending so let's take a moment to calculate what happens if white just simply starts grabbing the pawn that has been pushed to d4 now if anyone has an answer, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Otherwise, just type something in the chat. You can take the knight on f3 with the bishop. OK, so after taking on d4, you want to take the knight now. Yeah. OK, we get g takes f3. And then we take back. Now we still have three attackers, though, right? Three and it's protected twice. We make defenders in blue. So we're still not winning out here. That is definitely a part of it though, because that is a way to reduce the defenders by one. But we do need a bit more subtlety. Bishop c6. Yeah. Bishop c6. Okay, we probably that was way linear. Bishop c6. We can now consider probably two moves for white. Let's look at queen c4. Okay, so is the only move that stays protecting the pawn? Is there a continuation from this? Bishop b5. Now you want to go bishop b5. Okay, that's an idea. Mm. Well, well, you could take the knight now. Yeah. So bishop takes f3. Yeah. Because think... after you take with the pawn, you attack the queen. Yeah, which I think this is a key idea. I want to also look at the other idea that was mentioned. Yeah. Because now you're on the queen and the pawn's going to stay alive, which 
is obviously what we wanted in the first place. If we go bishop b5, though, what is white going to do? Trying to work out if we just want to capture that bishop or... Hmm. It's not so obvious. Could we consider capturing on c5? I think that might work. Am I being crazy taking this? No, I don't know what black plays. Does he capture the queen? Is that... Does he play rook? Okay, now I can... Hmm. Does anyone have any ideas here of how black would continue? Because I, otherwise I think this might just refute bishop b5. Because now white is going to be up at pawn. So I think this is the problem with bishop b5. But the line given, I think, just works for black. So You're gonna... Rook takes d2. Mm, rook takes d2. But I mean, we can just play rook takes, right? And we're still yeah. down a pawn. So at the very least, the... white just try. Take the pawn with the, pawn. the rook. Yeah, rook takes. Probably something ugly, like. Okay, it's not even that ugly though. Queen b3. And we have an extra pawn as white. So at the very least, I think white is better. But this is an idea. But okay, as was mentioned, we can throw in this clever taking of the knight here with first throwing in bishop c6 to provoke the queen to come to the open file. And then if queen c2, we can still take the knight. Yeah. And after g takes, takes on d4. And something like knight a4. Okay, this positionless knight is very stranded now. And this pawn is giving black quite a nice space advantage. I think if we continue something like queen b5, and we're on the queen, so he can't immediately grab our d pawn. So these are all variations that have to be considered when you advance the pawns, which, okay, as I stated earlier, at the correct moment is very important. Because if you push your pawns too early and you lose them, then, well, suddenly you have nothing. Whereas, okay, obviously Karpov is in some 1500 on Lee chess. He did calculate before he moved. White saw that and he chose to play knight e2. And after d takes e3, f takes e3, there's immediately a lot of weaknesses for white. And we can argue, sure, there's a weakness for black, maybe even two weaknesses, but it's a lot easier to defend the weaknesses for black than it is for white to defend his weaknesses. So black goes c4, opening up his queen. Knight d4 is played to block that attack on the weak pawn. Queen comes back to c7. The queen is wanting to target these weaknesses. Knight h4 gets played. Queen e5 coming in to attack the e pawn. King h1. And what should black play in this position? Anyone got an idea? Who wants to fall for my trap? What's the idea of black captures either one of these pawns? Can someone tell me? Uh, knight f5. You get four. Yeah, there's knight f5. So simply what Karpov does, he just goes king g8 and steps out of all of those problems. Very <coughs> nice, quiet move. And now you have to wonder, like, what are knights, white's knights doing? This knight on the side of the board looks a bit funny now. Plays knight f3. Queen takes g3. We get rook takes d8. Yeah. If black does capture of his rook, white can grab on c5, and he's going to pick up a pawn for his troubles at least. So black doesn't even give him that. He takes with the bishop, queen b4, targeting bishop on b7. We get bishop b4, looking to trade off white's light squared bishop, which is probably his most dangerous piece at the moment. And of course, if white does play bishop takes e4, 
before he's just inviting Black's knight to come into all those weak squares around the king. So after bishop takes e4, knight e4, as we discussed, white continued of rook d4. I am glossing over this quite quickly because, okay, we've already seen the main strategic idea from this example with the d4 advance. This is just kind of the aftermath of that. Yeah, knight f2 gets played. Black is trying to attack the white king in every way. King g1 and knight d3. The knight comes to a very nice outpost. If, for example, black decides to play rook takes c5, yeah, c4, I'm trying to work. Okay, the queen's hanging, so we should not be stupid. Queen, that's why the queen came to b7, rook to b8, queen d7, and bishop c7. Now, what is black's threat in this position? Very caveman-like approach. Checkmate. You just it's like black, almost like um, queen goes to f two. Yeah. King one. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. suffer. And then you get that smothered mate. Yes. Yeah. Very well. I forgot what that word was. <laughs> yeah. No. It's a funny thing because your smothered mate, you see, it's a lot at the start, and then these top grandmasters never really featured in this their games because they're actually good and understand when they have weak squares around their king. Which, okay, he goes king h1, which is his attempt at stopping that, but rook takes b2 is just really strong. White is forced to sacrifice the exchange, which now if he has the worst position and arguably black has the compensation. Queen d6, just looking to trade queens. Queen to e4. They played out a few more moves, but yeah, white chose to resign. So if we go back again to the start here, this all came about really from the d4 advance. If we look at this position, what other plans could black really look to adopt? There's very little. d4 is key. He has to get this attack going. And from this, he deprives white's pieces of a lot of squares. And then he uses that space advantage to create weaknesses. And then he just targets the weaknesses. It looks very easy in hindsight, but it's actually a really nice game from Karpov. So, in this example, we saw the first plan you can adopt when you're playing with the hanging pawns. We will get to looking at how to play against the hanging pawns a bit later on in the evening. But we saw this plan of d the d pawn advancing to make way for the bishop, and it worked out really nicely. Let's look at another plan that black can potentially adopt. So if we look in this position and we try to apply the same plan, let's say black thinks he can push his deep one because he saw Karpov's games. He thinks he's Karpov, but he's actually Nimzovich who lived long before Karpov. But was it long before Karpov? I think he was at least a decent amount before Karpov. I don't know if they overlapped. Probably not. We would get a pawn exchange. And the difference in this position is that though, sure, we do keep the deep one. First of all, it gets targeted, yeah, and it might get lost immediately. But also white's pieces have very nice squares. The bishop on d3 is doing a great job blockading. You can imagine white swinging his f rook to d1, and his play is very, very easy. There's no problems really caused for him. So this plan of pushing the deep one isn't really good. So we need to come up with another plan for black. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes. You can, if you have any ideas, you're welcome to share them. Uh, my first idea would be uh, connecting the rooks. Okay, so how do you want to uh, do that? Yeah, uh, and then I think I would just uh, attack the weaknesses first. Afterwards, after connecting the rooks, then the weaknesses. Okay, so, uh, so this, what move would you want to play? Yeah. Um, I would try move knight d7. You want to go knight d7? Is are you wanting to? Okay, knight. Are you wanting to come to b6 or what's the idea? Um, either b6 or b5, right? B5. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. And then Lucian wanted to bring out the queen. I think those are both very natural moves that I think 
I could definitely see myself playing that. And in the game, Karpov did play queen b6. But here we're mainly looking at a different idea to the d4 advance. And that is the advance of c4. Which Yeah, I was about to ask about c4. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting move. Because, okay, immediately the first one of the rules we're always taught in chess is pawns don't move backwards. So if you play c4, you don't want to come back later and say, can I move that pawn back a square? Because you're not going to be allowed to do that, obviously. So what are the pros and cons of c4, Mr. Rowan, since you were thinking about it? Well, the, the first pro is it get, gets the bishop to move away from the from the um, d3 square or this long diagonal of h7 I mean, to, 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 to b1. one. But yeah, I get what you're saying. You're at least gaining a tempo at the very least. Yeah. Uh, and then I was thinking about trying to play d4 afterwards. That I, that was the line I was looking at. C4, then bishop moves, then d4. Mm. Seeing if it works then. Okay. Just yeah. to... It's an interesting idea. I think this pawn might be a bit too weak to do that immediately, which might be what you were trying to make up, find a way to make it work. Yeah. But mm. then another idea that sprung to my mind is trying to just get your knight to... to e5 and trying to move the the um c3 knight but then again if he captures you got a weak c pawn so these were the ideas i was thinking about i wasn't yeah. trying to make no that's just trying to see good. how to make it work okay yeah and i actually think c4 is the right move your main con is you're obviously giving up the square it's very easy for us to imagine the white knight coming there very quickly and that's a very nice outpost for it but you're hoping to make up for that by saying that this b pawn is now weak. The b pawn's effectively a backwards pawn. Playing b3 is going to be very probably not advised for white. So in the game, Kopov started. Okay, it's not Kopov. It's now Nimzovich playing against Rubinstein. Two other, shall we say, greats of chess. He played queen b6, and after queen a3, then he went c4. Which, okay, this approach, it's a lot slower than the previous game where we saw the deep one getting pushed and there was fireworks, there was a kingside attack, and it was very exciting. This is more positional in nature. It's a trade-off. We've chased this bishop away from the diagonal, we've potentially gifted white the d4 square, and we've solidified b2 as a weakness. So here, black continues with a5. Can someone tell me the idea behind a5? Uh, I think just to gain a bit more space on the queen's. Yeah, it is gaining space. I think there's there's a more direct move play that I think it's directly preparing. Probably queen b5. Yeah, b5. queen b5 is definitely, I think, the main idea. b4. But because, okay, if white is forced to capture that, it fixes black structure. Suddenly those pawns look very scary. The a pawn is going to be weak, and it's very nice for black. In the game, white put his rook in the center, and then that idea happened with queen b4. White played rook d4. Now, black has the option of doubling white's pawns, and I think it would be a very good option to consider. I would definitely be tempted to do it in my games. I'm actually curious, what, what does the engine say? Let, let's do some cheating. Engine doesn't even think about it. Okay, it does say black is slightly better. These pawns are weak. I would say in a practical game, I would really like my position with black. But okay, obviously, I'm sure Nimzovich did consider that. In the game, he just went rook d8, securing his pawn first. I think Mr. Telmarcus did give me a nice list of rules of conduct here. So this is ideas to keep in mind when you're playing with hanging pawns. So the first one, which we've seen... It's, okay, we haven't talked about it too much, but keeping pieces on the board, the bishop pair in particular, the important because it can support an attack. The idea of attacking when you have these pawn weaknesses, they give you a space advantage. You want to make use of that. And keep good control of the central squares. We also talked about that a bit. Yeah, we see defending your hanging pawns is very important. If you don't defend your pawns, then you don't have pawns, and that's not very good. We also want to look to exploit all dynamic possibilities and look for the correct moment for a pawn advance. This has been a key feature in the two games we've looked at, pushing the pawns at the right time. So this move from Nimzovich is very principled if he was listening to all those principles. 
Here, white chooses to play rook d8, trying to double up on this pawn weakness. Now, black just decides he's going to protect it. He's in no hurry. He just wants to play really solid chess. Bishop to f3 is played, attacking the d-pawn. And now he doubles up on the fence. I don't know why there's arrows giving away all the moves here. But knight b1 is now played. White says, OK, if you don't want to double my pawns, you're not allowed to anymore which I okay, guess is a really solid approach. Black now changes his mind. He goes rook b8. He's had enough defending his pawn. He wants to now look to attack. White defends the pawn with rook d2. And now we get queen takes a3, knight takes a3, and rook b7. Which, okay, now the b2 pawn is targeted. There is some tactical ideas looming of knight takes c4 and then rook d8 potentially being in the air i don't know if it works exactly now because there is still maybe some defense from knight e8 which might get ugly bishop takes d5 knight takes d5 rook d5 white deems his position bad enough that he's willing to sack an exchange which okay i would look to grovel a bit more in this position but this pawn is just so weak and when this pawn falls the a pawn is going to fall the knight on a3 is going to be very out of the game which okay he chooses to give this up and okay we're not going to spend time looking at this ending but i think any top grandmaster should be converting this with ease for black it's a clean exchange up and there's potentially this pass pawn and if white chops it off okay which i presume is what he has to do we're going to get some ending. He probably has to take with the rook here. And okay, the knight is definitely not going to beat the rook in this ending. So if we go back to the starting position, which we looked at, this whole idea of c4 is another alternative. It's more positional, maybe if you want to play a bit more solidly, it's something you need to consider. Of course, all these options you need to consider at the right plan, at the right time. So pushing c4 and pushing d4 are the two we've looked at. We will look at one or two more plans and then we'll get on to how we can play against the hanging pawns. So if we look at this position, spend some time assessing it, try to evaluate who you think is better and how white should continue. It is white to play. Mm. Bishop e3. You want to go bishop e3 and you want to solidify the center, right? So we, yeah. let's just and say a next three, rook. and then you're going to put the rooks in the center. Yeah. And, yeah. Then so, yeah. and then you have the idea of looking for the d5 advance, looking for the c5 advance. Yeah, I definitely think white is white better. White's probably better after that. I would definitely be drawn to this. This time Nimzovich is the one playing for the hanging pawns and he brings across a new idea which we haven't looked at which is to attack on the queen side often you'll see in these structures black goes b6 or again if it's white he'll go b3 with the idea of stopping that c pawn advance which okay this gives us a new target so what was played in the game is a5 I think Tyler's idea is perfectly valid and it's probably just as good but white chose this plan rather and the whole idea is that the weak B pawn is going to be more of a target than the weak C and D pawns. Yeah, we got bishop f6. I think it is also worth noting in this game, Nimzovic was just needing a draw to win the tournament, I believe, which, okay, is obviously going to affect how you play the game. No matter how everyone tells you if you only need a draw, play for a win or something, it's going to affect your decisions. So he exchanged on b6. And he played bishop e3. And it's, it's exactly what Tyler was wanting to play. Bishop e3 It's just solidifying all the pawns. Now you have ideas of bringing the rooks to the c and d file. You could even come to the b file now. Black chooses to just go h3. And we get h3. h6 and h3. Just making luft for the king. We get rook to c8. And rook c1. Just defending. There's no hurry for white. He's perfectly happy of a draw. Rook b8 is played. Black changes his mind. He realizes he might need to protect the b pawn in the future. We get a rook exchange. 
and 92. This now is the idea of obviously coming to e4. It's the idea of maybe playing bishop f3 to exchange the bishops. It's a multi purpose move. Playing moves with two ideas is always something we want to look to do. Bishop e7, bishop just comes back potentially to come to d6 or to try and hold the c5 advance. Bishop f3 is played, as we mentioned, looking to trade. Rook a3, very strong move. Back in the queen. The queen is forced to drop back. We get a bishop exchange. And it's already quite a weird position now, I would say. Because I don't think white is trying to win overly. Because, like, as I said, he just needs a draw. But this b pawn looks very weak. But white has no active plan. So it's all in black's court at the moment. He goes rook a4, trying to target the c4 pawn. Queen d2. And bishop a3, attacking the rook. Rook c2, the bishop comes back. And we get these elite grandmaster repetitions where they kind of flirt with each other that, oh, we'll take a draw. And in this game, he decides not to take a draw because like, I presume the person playing black wanted to at least make it look like they were fighting. Queen a7, queen d3, rook a3, queen to e4, knight to f6, queen c6. Can anyone spot an attempt black can play to try and win this position? Because, okay, it looks like nothing much is happening at the moment. Can we get some dynamic ideas for black? Uh, like rook a1? Mm, if rook a1... Okay, obviously I can't take it. I think rook a1 is an interesting try. I'm slightly worried that our bishop is hanging though. Oh, right. And the yes. queen can come yeah. back to f4 and protect our bishop in the end. But yeah, I'm if our bishop... <laughs> uh, we'll forgive you. But I think if the bishop's not hanging, that is probably slightly annoying. I didn't say it was a good attempt to win. I just need an attempt to win. Maybe queen b8. Queen b8. Just protecting everything. Yeah, you solidify everything. Yeah, I think this is definitely an idea. Because now you keep the bishop guarding the h2 square and you always have those back rank ideas. So, yeah, this is definitely a possibility. Did anyone consider rook takes e3? I consider that, but I thought it was nonsense. No. Yeah, I, I also thought it was nonsense. And I, I spent a long time, like a year ago, trying to work out why this is good. And I, I'm still trying to remember. Because if I turn on my computer now, it's going to say zeros off the bishop g3. Which, okay, this isn't immediately clear. Because to me, it looks like white's up an exchange. I presume we're getting enough counterplay coming of queen a2 and something like this. And then maybe the knight coming into e4. But this could this is what black played which and then it's really funny because white's happy of a draw so he just takes the bishop <laughs> and then they agree to draw which okay this is grandmaster chess but it would have been interesting i think if he played f takes e3 i don't even know who's trying to win at that stage but white wanted to avoid all these complications 
but now we've seen a third plan right so in this game we saw the plan of pushing the a pawn if i come back to the start not the most exciting game unfortunately just ending in a draw at least it can't be worse than those like games they're playing on that magnus carlson tour i watched like i think it was the third or fourth place playoff or something they just made four draws in like 50 moves total every game was a 10 move draw so at least it wasn't as bad as that but yeah as i was saying before i started complaining this idea of creating a weakness on the queen side we have the idea of the central breaks and now we're going to look at one more idea so this position okay again black is playing with the hanging pawns so we want to try find a way to combine all of the ideas we've been looking at spend some time trying to work out how black should continue here i think it is important to note white does have one shall we say almost a threat he has an idea he wants to play and the right move for us is to stop that idea and advance our ideas at the same time so if someone can come up some candidate moves that would be nice c4 c4 okay obviously now we have the idea of pushing c3 which looks very tempting yeah so i'm trying to work out now what's the best way to counter this hmm yeah, I really like the look of C4 at first. I feel like there should be some tactical justification. Otherwise, it's just the best move I've ever seen. What about like knight oh. to D4? Kind of thing. Knight D4 looks... Maybe you can do knight D4 and then, okay, where does the queen go? Probably E6. Okay, I don't want to go to E7. I don't know, knight F. Knight G6. No, queen G6 maybe. If queen G6... Maybe we can even continue with knight f4, yeah? Nice and if, you, you, you probably want to take oh. that, right? Yeah, take a little bit. takes, this. queen takes. Can you push that c4, no, c3 for me? I don't think you can anymore. Can you still? Oh, what's... I wanted to take the knight. You take it the rook. Okay, you can take it the rook, yeah, yeah. I was, I was trying to suddenly calculate this as well, but yeah. Okay, that does seem to just counter that. Um, Do we have a better move here? Because I like the knight d4 idea. Otherwise, this just looks really strong. Um, Can we not take this? Is there some reason we can't take this now? Because this is hanging because the knight moved from t2. Although I, there is a fork in the end with obviously knight d2. Hitting the queen and the bishop. Rook a c eight. Rook a c eight. It all looks pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Hmm. I like this idea of c four. I'm I'm curious. I am terribly prepared. So let me let me see what our stockfish friend says. What does it think about c four? Thinks knight d four is round suggested. Queen g six, and then it wants to take on c four. Rook c eight. And then it just wants to say there's no real problem and go knight f4. Okay, this is a nice approach. Because now, okay, if you trade, you can you no longer have this advance. So if you just take with the rook, you're playing for an isolated pawn. At the very least, white can try and prove that's a weakness in the end game. And I'm not sure where we can improve on this with black. I do like the idea of c4 though. Any other ideas for black? For myself, I was thinking of d4. You want to go d4. d4 is always tempting, right? Because we're shutting down this bishop, we're opening our bishop. I think oh. d4 is also definitely something that's interesting. I'm curious though, maybe white can just say, okay, you've weakened the square now. What if we just go knight a3? And white tries to just blockade the pawns of his knights. I don't know if black really has too much going on yet. I think white could have just have played e3 instead of not a3. Yeah, e3 is e3. Yeah, e3 is just breaking up immediately. Maybe there's 
some idea of knight c3. I'm not sure. Knight c3. Isolated pawn. It was going to be a bad inning. Knight c3 just loses with bishop takes b7. You need a wake up round. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, it's a nice <laughs> trick. It's I don't think it's anything else. Well, like, you, it, what happens if you just take the knight? Yeah. yeah, I think you have to. And then I was thinking this, and there's ideas of this. It's a mess, at least. Like I don't think I'm not so convinced. Blacks last year, right? Because of king takes, we play this check even, and we pick up the knight, and the bishop's still hanging, and we get to keep the pawn. Oh, what? Hmm? Um, I can be making mistakes here, so if I am saying something wrong, please do correct me. So, but I think this does work. I think. But even, but it feels weird, right? Putting the knight on c3. So, at the very least, e3 needs to be considered for white. I fouled with my plan of knight a3. At the very least, it's hard for black to find a way to continue and knight blockades the pawns. But those are both options. In the game, black chose to play f5, which, okay, looks very unnatural at first until we realize, okay, he didn't feel d4, or c4 were that great. And he was slightly scared that the white knight was coming to f4. And okay, let's just say he does nothing with knight f4. It's kind of annoying to move this queen somewhere. So he chose to play f5 with the idea that if knight f4, he can just put his queen on f7. It stays protecting the d-pawn. He can potentially play g5 or something if he's feeling really adventurous. White didn't go for the knight f4. He just went rook d1. The queen came back to f7 anyway. And now the knight came to f4. Black centralized his rooks. Again, it was stressed at the start that you only want to advance the pawns at the right moment. So getting all your pieces into play beforehand is often a good idea if you can do it. Knight e3, which now allows bishop takes f4, ruining white's kingside. Again, trying to attack the kingside when he can. And now he plays d4. So the knight is on e3, so now Tyler's idea of pushing e3 doesn't really work. He can still pretend to blockade on c4 at some stage, which could be an idea. The knight instead came to f1, planning to come around to g3 and secure the king slightly, because there's very tempting ideas of queen g6, and then moving the knight somewhere, unleashing the light squared bishop. Queen g6 did come, f3 gets played, murdering white's own bishop, knight f6, knight g3, Knight d5, eyeing that very nice weak e3 square. And now bishop h3 gets played. And I would like us to come up with some candidate moves for black. So I think we would all agree black is probably better here. Yeah? And I think there is some very tempting moves that look good. So let's just get some ideas of what you guys would look to play in this position. Knight e3. Yeah, knight e3 makes a ton of sense because we're also protecting our c5 pawn. I think knight e3 is what any sane and rational person would play. We attack the rook, we protect our pawn. We have ideas of pushing a5, a4, no, I mean h5 and h4 to disturb that knight. And it's a really nice position for black. And he's not even down a pawn. So this is what I think any common person would do. But apparently this is a move. Which, okay, off the bishop takes f5, it looks like black just hung a rook, which he kind of just did. Off the queen f6, knight takes rook, queen takes f5. He's trying to claim that light sweat bishop was needed for white to protect the king. And okay, I wouldn't recommend sacrificing exchange when your position is so good to begin with, but this is what Mr. Yusupov chose to do. There is definitely an attack going, but it's not something I would have wanted to do. Rook takes d4. Queen came to h5, targeting that weak pawn on f3. Knight g3. Queen takes f3. Queen f1, looking for a queen trade. Black obviously declines that. He's attacking. He wants to keep pieces on the board. 
knight to e2, queen c2, rook c1, and the queen comes back to g6. There's very tempting ideas coming of knight e3. The knight came to g3, blocking the check. Queen to b6, attacking the rook, pinning it to the king, and all those weak dark squares. We look how weak the white king is on these long diagonals. Which, okay, one of our rules was to try to keep the bishop here if we can. Obviously, black couldn't do that in this game, but he still has one bishop and his queen is very strongly placed. Queen f2, knight f6, rook to d2, and the queen, again, declining the queen trade, just coming to e6. And even though black is down in exchange, he's been down exchange for a while, he has two pieces now, because he white gave it back to develop. So he's in no hurry. Rook to e1, queen a6. Again, black's just maneuvering his queen. Queen to f1, white is asking very nicely for a queen trade. Black decides to oblige him and just takes control of the file. H3, rook e3, black's pieces are so much more active. Knight f5, rook takes h3, rook c1, and knight c3, stopping that counterplay. Black really doesn't want to let the white rooks into the game. We see this knight is very conveniently covering d7. Rook h2 got played, is, and now knight e2, which, okay, is a very nice tactic that my arrows spoiled for us. Obviously, if rook captures, this bishop is unleashed, and we get a skewer on the rook on c1. So I think the game ended. Okay, they played a few more moves, but I don't think this is necessary. Black is up a full piece. And okay, he brings all these pieces into the game and then he simply resigns. So, okay, we've looked, let's just recap quickly what we've been looking at. So we have the ideas, the standard plans we can play when we have the hanging pawns. We wanna play that D4, D5 breakthrough. We saw that in the first game where the light squared bishop on b7 got unleashed and led to really strong attack. Blockaded security with the c4, c5 advance, which okay, of course these can be interchangeable for black and white, where he pushed his pawn, he cramped his opponent's pieces and he targeted the weak b-pawn. We saw the attack on the queen side of a4, a5. That was in the game where Nimzovich was just content with a draw. So we didn't get to see him try to push his position to the fullest, but we still saw some of the ideas. And then attacking of the F-pawn, like we saw in this game. Attack of the F-pawn, it's a very common idea. Whenever you're attacking and you need that extra kick, you throw the F-pawn. All these grandmasters nowadays, they just throw their H-pawns and try to blow up the enemy king side. All of these, your standard attacking ideas. A lot of the ideas that you also have of isolated pawns you can use when playing with the hanging pawns. But now we're going to look at kind of the other side of the coin. How can you play against the hanging pawns? So we're going to see some ideas here, the standard plans, and we're going to have our rules of conduct for the other side. So if your opponent wants to keep pieces on the board, you probably want to exchange pieces. So we're kind of seeing the inverse. So try to exchange with your opponent's active pieces. If he has the bishop here, it's particularly important to swap off one of his bishops. We want to concentrate your fire on the hanging pawns. Obviously, you don't want to let those pawns advance. So if you can target them, force them to advance prematurely and then play a pawn break, that's also very nice. We want to control the squares in front of them, not let white use those squares as outposts. And then we have another rule here. It is at favorable to Fianchetto, the bishop, and they do not get in the way of the major pieces. And in addition, they increase the pressure on the pawns. This is to do with, because you have less space, it's just easier to find a square fianchettoing the bishop than it is to put the bishop in front of the pawn. So we're going to see some of these rules and ideas now applied in a game. The first one we're going to look at is Max Uwe against Mr. Ryshevsky. This is obviously an older game. Ryshevsky is always the guy, I don't know, there's a very famous picture. I don't know why I always bring it up, but it's, he's like six or seven years old and he's playing against a bunch of these really old stereotypical masters in like a simultaneous and he's just beating them all. That's Samuel Ryshevsky. If you've seen the picture, you'll know what I'm talking about. But he's playing black in this game. We're going to see it from his perspective. So the, this game went d4, knight f6, c4, e6, 
knight c3, bishop b4, we get a Nimzo Indian. The top players today still play this quite frequently, so it's something we should all be aware of. e3, c5. Black's main idea in these hyper-modern openings is to attack the center later on. So bishop d3, castles, and a3. Bishop takes c3, b takes c3. So now our structure is kind of formed. Black's plan is very easy, which is why a lot of people like playing the Nimzo Indian. He wants to look to target these doubled pawns. So you'll see a lot of games where they're placing like b6, bishop a6, knight c6, and knight a5, just to get at those pawns. And then rook c8 later on, taking on d4 at the right moment and getting all these pieces to target those weak pawns. He straight up starts with b6, knight e2 gets played, bishop b7. In this game, black chooses to place his bishop on the long diagonal instead of going for the plan that I had mentioned previously. White castles, we get pawn to d6, queen c2, and now pawn d5, which, okay, this looks like a classic example of indecision. It is slightly, there's a slight nuance to it, because he's saying with White having placed his queen on c2, it's potentially a target when the rook comes to c8, which, okay, I don't know if this is worth the extra tempo. I would definitely have wanted to play d5 in one move, but okay, I can't go about judging these people too much. c takes d5, queen takes d5, knight f4, queen came back to c6, and c4. So question, does playing g5 win a piece? because this knight has to stay protecting g2. Uh, no, because he plays d5. Yeah, that's correct. If g5, he doesn't have to move the knight, he can just push his pawn. And, okay, this is not going to be very fun. We now have to wonder why we moved this g-pawn. So that's the whole idea behind c4. Because like I'm sure white saw, okay, this knight is protecting. He has to worry about this threat. So instead of playing some ugly move like f3, he finds a creative way to defend it while still playing c4, which is a move he'd probably want to play anyway. c takes d4, and e takes d4. So now our structure has been established. We have the two hanging pawns. We've seen the plans that can be adopted of these hanging pawns. And black also knows it. So now we need to look at some plans for black. And I think the first one, which we've been talking about, is he needs to target the pawns. If he can force all of white's pieces to be stuck defending them, that's usually quite nice for him. Here he just starts with knight d7, bishop b2, and rook e8. This is the other plan we're going to see in some other examples where he can push e5 and try and break up the center as much as possible. There's also, I think, an idea we're going to see in another game where he plays b5 with a similar plan. If black can break up the center and turn it into an isolated pawn position or something similar to that, that's usually more favorable for him. White goes rook e1. He obviously doesn't want to allow those ideas. It's very important that we understand our opponent's plan so we can go against them. So even if you're not someone who's going to play a lot with isolated of these hanging pawn positions, you still need to understand them because they can arise from many different openings. In fact, I think like any d4 setups that gets played, you can end up with these hanging pawn positions. Rook c8, rook c1, and knight f8. Black just gets his knight out the way. He has ideas of bringing the knight to g6 to trade it all for white's knight. Because again, trading pieces is often one of Black's key defensive ideas. Also, you could play rook d8 and look to target the pawns, as we've discussed. Bishop f1 is played. White just wants to shore up the defense of his g2 square, looking nice and solid because, okay, he's worried about knight g6 coming. Knight g6 does come. Knight takes g6, h takes g6, and rook to e3. 
Rook e3, it's a very nice attacking idea. Obviously, it can swing anywhere across this row. You could see some plan even later on where it attacks the queen side. But okay, immediately we're thinking attacking the king side. We're thinking doubling up the rooks and then maybe pushing d5. Black side steps out. He starts putting pressure on the pawns. Queen to e2. Why is queen e2 played? It has to do with one of the ideas we mentioned earlier for black. Yeah, yeah does it? Hmm? What's your uh, thoughts, Ron? That it's actually sort of pinned. If white wants to at some point play d5, yeah, he can't because. Yeah, but black's it's pinned after takes, the queen will be hanging. Yeah. Yeah, that's looking at your own ideas slightly too much, though. Because, okay, we do want to play d5 at the right moment. But more directly at the moment, black has a threat. And that's going b5. Which, okay, let's just say white does nothing. If b5 is allowed, you're kind of forced... Because, okay, as we said, this pawn is pinned, which you did note. You're kind of forced to play c5, and this is not what white wants to play in this position at all. In the previous examples where we were pushing the c pawn, where it was good for the side of the hanging pawns, the B pawn was a weakness, whereas now the B pawn's a strength. White, black is very happy having this weak square for itself. So queen e2 is played more to prevent that idea than it is for white's own ideas. Though that is a nice added bonus we have on the side, which is why queen e2 is done. Queen to d6 and rook h3. This whole rook swing idea, wanting to one day double up on the h file and give checkmate. Something that, okay, is probably a little far-fetched, but it's still an, it's an attempt. Yeah, black plays queen f4. Very nice square for the queen. I think black is threatening rook takes d4 now. I'm not entirely sure if the tactics work out. There might be some way for white to counter it, but it's an idea. That's definitely in the air. That's why white plays rook d1. Defending the pawn again. And we get bishop a6. So if we look at how well black is following this plan that we've laid out of attacking the hanging pawns in whichever way he can, we see the queen, the two rooks, and the bishop. Four out of five pieces are attacking the hanging pawns, and the knight is stopping the hanging pawn. So everything black is doing is around these pawns. Rook f3 gets played. He wants to unstabilize the queen. The queen's very well placed, though. Queen e4. Black is happy trading pieces. Again, he's playing with less space, so trading pieces is almost always good for him. Rook e3. White says, please no trade. He goes queen g4. And we get f3. Again, putting pressure on the queen. The queen now gets to f4. And he goes g3. White is willing to make these pawn weaknesses by his king, which I get could lead to an attack for black in the long term but he just feels he needs to drive the queen away. He understands he has a long-term weakness and he needs to play as dynamically as he can. Queen h6 gets played, rook to c3, and now queen g5. So again, we see kind of a funny way of doing it because he could have come queen g5 in the first place, which we need to now work out why it's better playing queen g5 after the rook comes to c3. Can anyone give an idea why we would wait for the rook to go to c3 before? Because rook can go to D, uh, e5 now. Yeah, e5 and our queen is flushed back and white gets very active. So this is a really nice little subtle team because now if you go rook e5, I think you can do something like even knight e7 might just be annoying. And the rook probably has to come back. And because it doesn't come with tempo. So this is a very nice subtlety that was played by black. Rook c3 gets played. 
and then the queen comes to g5. Now that that rook e5 idea is no longer present. And the queen manages to assist in blocking all the pawns from advancing. We get queen to f2, solidifying the center. Rook d7, black wants to double up and continue to target the pawns. Rook c1, rook c7, rook c2. Just again, stepping out of the way of this queen, allowing his bishop to move if he needs to. Queen a5. And now bishop c1 is played. Why is bishop c1 not the best move? It allows a resource for black. Um, eight, knight. Eight. Oh, you can go. I was thinking uh, knight d5 because of the pin on the c pawn. Yeah, that is the whole problem now. It's when you move a piece, it's not where it was. Right, so after knight d5, this bishop is no longer protecting the rook, so you cannot capture this pawn without giving up an exchange. And if you just move the rook, you're gonna lose the c pawn because now there's just too much attackers. And you really can't allow this as white because if you lose the pawn, you're kind of losing everything you're playing for. So he chose rather to just take the knight, give up the exchange, and hope for some counterplay, which Okay, I don't think is actually there, and he's just trying to pretend. So after rook takes c3, queen takes c3, bishop to b2, getting on the long diagonal, queen b3, he does get to capture on a6, but now rook c2 is played, and black is simply too active, and he is just going to pick up that b2 bishop. White tries to be sneaky and run his d4, which I guess a Nice attempt, but after rook takes f2, he pushes queen d5, and the pawn is basically stopped. And two bishops are not worth anywhere close to the same amount as a queen. So if we look in this game, it's not like black did anything profound, right? If we go back to where the hanging pawn started, gr something like here. All he does is he gets all his pieces active. Simple chess. He starts attacking the pawns. I gave threatens to play this e pawn break. Then he just puts all these rooks on the files. He forces white to get slightly passive. He trades off pieces. And he doesn't do anything fancy. And that's all you need to do is you need to play really solidly. You need to not allow these dynamic ideas from white. And you need to stick to the game plan of trading pieces, which he does very nicely. Yeah. There's some nice maneuvers with his queen. He understands some of the subtleties very well. Let's move on to our next example. Let me just grab some water quickly. Okay, so this game, we're gonna again be looking at the same ideas and plans. I think if I'm right, white is the side playing against the hanging pawns here. So let me flip the board around. This game is Mr. Yusupov against Jay Clovens. So I don't think anyone's ever heard of Clovens. So I'd put my money on Yusupov winning if I were had to bet. We get pawn to d4, knight of six, knight of three, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e7, bishop g5. Mr. Yusupov had clearly watched the Netflix show. Castles, rook c1. Does anyone understand why rook c1 is played in this position? The queen's gambit. Yeah, is if the knight comes to like at to e4 at any point and decide to take the knight, you can just recapture with the rook or with yeah. the pawn. Have your rook. You already have your rook. Quite a few reasons to it. That is definitely one of them. You don't have to react because otherwise, if that doubled pawn is loud, it's not very good. Rowan, were you going to say something? I was going to say, I don't play the Queen's Gambit, so I don't <laughs> know much about it. Yeah, no, that makes fair enough. The other idea is, I get black in these positions. He wants to try to go knight d7 and c5 sometimes, and that is very much stopped by the rook being on c1. So it's, some, it's a nice little plan. 
Because if you play E3, yeah, I believe the main line is something. I don't know if you go C5 yeah, immediately or if you go knight D7 first, but black can play C5 and it's a bit more active and dynamic. Whereas off the rook C1, you kind of reduce his counterplay quite a bit. H6 gets played, bishop H4, B6, C takes D5. Your knight takes D5 is played, which, okay, you always have this conundrum as bl black and as white, whether you want to trade the dark sweat bishops or not. Your black decides he's willing to trade them. So the takes, takes, we get bishop takes E7, queen takes E7, and G3, which, okay, I re if I remember, this was one of the ideas we listed here. It is favorable to fianchetta the bishops because they don't get in the way. So yeah, we see... White is going to fianchetta the one bishop he has left. Bishop e6. It's a very solid plan. He just wants to secure his center. There's a bit more active way to do this. Who can come up with a more active way for black to develop his bishop here? Maybe a way to nullify white's bishop if we can. Wouldn't it be bishop f5 followed by bishop e4? Yeah, that's a very nice idea that they did list here. Yeah. But okay, if you go something like bishop g4, you're doing nothing but giving yourself your bishop a target and you never really want to take the knight. Bishop f5 and bishop e4, I think, is probably the best plan in this position. But a lot of these, shall we say, older grandmasters, they often play these isolated pawns and hanging pawn positions by putting the bishop on e6 which is slightly more passive and a lot of your top grand was try to be more active. So that's definitely something you can consider if you ever are preparing some of these positions. Bishop g2, rook c8. Black wants to go c5, castles, he plays e c5, he takes, b takes. And now we have our structure and white needs to now find the best way to play against it. He starts by going knight e5, which, okay, now his bishop's attacking. If we look, without white doing anything fancy, he already has three pieces attacking the hanging pawns, which is something we always want to look to do. Okay, if you look at the notes on the side here, it talks about how knight e5 isn't the best move and that the best move is something like knight e1 or knight d2, trying to stop pawns and actively fight against them. Knight e5, though, is a very natural move. Knight d7, he chooses not to trade. And it's forced back with knight d3. Rook b8 gets played, targeting the b-pawn. And the pawn advances to b3. Which here, the pawn on b3, it's also helping to prevent the advance of the pawns. Which is why b3 is played over something like rook c2 or queen d2 aren't as good. d4, it's kind of slightly premature if you ask me. I would have wanted white to wait slightly longer. Because after d4, he's no longer has the idea of pushing c4, and he's slightly limited in what his ideas. Does anyone have another plan here that black could have adopted other than pushing d4? One of the plans we discussed slightly a bit earlier. Are you talking about like a5, a4? Yeah, I would definitely consider that. Because I mean, okay, this b3 is kind of a hook and it creates a nice weakness. Uh, I keep clicking the wrong thing here. If we just played a5, there's a variation given here where white activates his knight. And then going d4 with always this idea of playing a4 at the right moment. And this, I think this is analysis by Yusuf of himself. And he evaluated this position as slightly better for white, but black has some counterplay. So he, d4 is a very solid approach by black, but I'm not the biggest fan of it. Knight of four. Thinking, hmm? Yeah. I was thinking instead of playing d4, um, a5 and a. A5 and A4 is okay, but I was really thinking like knight B6 or something, and then pushing C4 and opening up the 
files. No, I think it, yeah, it's, you mentioned this knight b6 plan in another example as well. Let, let's just say you get it though. Do you want to play c4 here? In this example? Yeah, like what, what else are you doing? Because your idea was knight b6, right? And yeah. then I'm not sure me, c4. For me, it just looks, looks good. Okay. Because, yeah, it, it looks nice, but I kind of, I'm worried about like, what is black doing? If he's not pushing C4 immediately, I don't see a way for him to improve. And I'm worried that C4 immediately might not be the strongest thing. Maybe it is. But what about an idea of tonight B6 to play, still to play D4 and then put your knight on, on uh, D5? Yeah, that is another plan. You get a lot of options. And I think the knight is better on B6 than on D7. So you can definitely consider this plan. I don't, the question you have to ask yourself is you developing your knight to b6, is that worth giving white, say, time to go like queen d2 and rook d1? Which, okay, I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, I think that push of c4 is, it's one of our plans. And if you can time I'm it. I'm just curious, yep. uh, like for white, like if knight to, to b6 if you can't immediately play like e4 yeah e4 it's principled right remember we talked about the e and the v form break you have to because add... now if you push the, that knight looks very silly because he has absolutely no squares now knight d7 is probably the next move right uh, <laughs> so. i feel like then you start pushing a5 and a4 but i just feel like it's, it's a lot to calculate now and i have to like you have to be really sure that knight b6 is the is the right move. Mm, yeah, it is, there's always pros and cons, right? And I think if you try this a5 push, I gotta, let's just say white is nice and does nothing. I don't think white reacts to this. I think he has to keep the weak pawn on b3 to kind of box out the knight. And it's there's definitely play for both sides. So this is still interesting. But okay, I did make two silly moves for white. So... I don't know. This might be six year. They're all plans. And in the end, it's more important that we understand our ideas behind the plans than if we're choosing the perfect plan. D4, I think, is a fine choice. I'm curious, what does computer say? Let's have Stockfish vindicate someone. What does it think of night B6? Thinks it's the worst move it's ever seen. No, it's what does it want to do? It wants to go something like night F4. And it just wants to exchange here, probably. And if we just throw this A pawn, it doesn't care. Yeah, but I mean, okay, this is a computer. We don't really trust its evaluations too much, but it's still definitely playable. In my experience, when you bring this knight to b6, it can often get restricted, but okay, if you can play your pawn breaks, it's worth it. But let's get back to the game where they went d4. Knight f4 was played. Bishop f5, keeping the bishop. Rook e1. Rook e1 is preparing that break that Rowan mentioned, either e4 or e3 at the right moment. Knight f6, and now e4. And now we have to wonder, should black capture en passant, or should he move his bishop? What are your guys' thoughts? Because there I... is pros and cons to both, I believe. Like, if he emphasizes, um, he's got a weak c pawn afterwards. Yeah, and the rook is but... opposite our queen. That's it. And I feel like, like, if he doesn't, he's got a pass pawn, a pass d pawn, but his c pawn is still weak. And yeah. if he moves the bishop, White does have the idea of just playing, um, e e five e six all of these and trying to attack black. Oh, okay. Yeah. I feel like in this exact position, if you move if you move the bishop but then that that a a5 and a4 plan does look pretty good. Okay. Yeah. But I think the... also if white moves the bishop white uh, if black moves the bishop white just has knight to e5. Ah, d5. Hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of ideas we need to consider. But I presume Tyler would want to bring the bishop probably to 
Do we want to go D7 or E6? Not sure. One of those. So I don't know. Because do you want to go E6 to block it out or D7 to repair A5? I'm not sure. Because maybe you're still jumping. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will go Bishop E6. You want to go Bishop E6? I don't know. Would we still jump in here, Rowan? How do we? Oh, what, why don't you just uh, play play E5 first? E5 first. Yeah, E5 first looks interesting. And this, again, it's dynamic, right? I don't think it's clear yeah. to me who's better. The knight... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's a trade-off. So it's up to... Like, Black has to choose which which part yeah. he wants to go. I, I, like I said, it's pros and cons to both, I think. Yeah. Does he want to simplify the position or does he want to keep everything complicated? Yeah. I personally think this is a better try for Black because of the emphasance, which happens in the game, if I look at this position... I just feel like that steep pawn is so weak. Yeah. I think this is probably objectively equal, but White is the one trying. Like, if anyone wins, it's White, mm. is my thoughts on the position. Because okay, equal, but White has, like, has like positional advantages. Yeah, it's the whole animal farm thing, right? Some people are more equal than others, but yeah. <laughs> Which, okay, I, I very much like White. I would back my chances to win this. And, and White still has the idea of playing Knight D5. Yeah. Because, yeah. We're trading, yeah. Which, and then I get the pawn is weak. So I think... I'm not sure why Black chose to play this way because in my if he doesn't emphasize on it's at least unclear. Like there's the plan Tyler mentions with a five, and he's at least trying. Whereas yeah, I feel like he's trying to lose, which is what happened in the game though. Queen e one, which okay White takes control of the e file. Queen to b six, the rook activates to e seven. Now he tries the a five idea. The queen comes into e five. We look how active all of White's pieces are getting. He just triples up on the E file. And I think there's some ideas here. What's the idea? I think he's intending knight D5. Yeah, yeah, that, that just screams out to me that this entire game just knight E5. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've been wanting to play it the whole time. <laughs> Which, yeah. yeah, it comes with a threat of mate, so it's even more scary, but yeah. Rook f8 has to be played, which this is really passive. And okay, I think white is just steamrolling. A4 gets played, yay. Black is finally doing something. But now the bishop's on c4 to guard the weak b3 pawn. Queen b4 is played, trying to put pressure on the rook. H3, white's in no hurry. Bishop c2, rook to e3, guarding the pawn. Rook d8. Queen is a Yeah, it's doesn't look fun and now there's even ideas like knight b6 potentially of the bishop moves or knight e6 even there's knight ideas e6. like yeah i don't imagine this is what black was hoping for <laughs> rook d1 check king g2 king h8 rook takes f7 rook takes queen takes and okay i think black should resign very shortly rook e7 and he throws in the towel yeah so this mm. shows the power of the e pawn bush, right? Even, okay, let's, there is the option, obviously, as we discussed, where he doesn't have to take it. And I think that's a better try, but he's still forcing black to make decisions. And it's kind of tempting to want to try and simplify and maybe say, okay, I can hold a draw. It's not that bad. And then the position slips more and more. Whereas otherwise he has to play this unclear position where I think white and black both have chances. Again, let's consult our neighborhood stockfish. What does it say? Yeah, it wants to go bishop g4, which is with tempo. So we should have considered this. I don't know why I was only looking at e6 and d7, but it thinks white is better either way. So that's... It's your, it's your mindset. You think black needs to defend this position, <laughs> so you want to play it backwards and defend. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And mindset's a massive part of chess. How you're thinking. We looked at that game of yours the other day where you have to, where you were saying you were happy of a draw and how differently you were playing just because of that. Yes. Which, okay, maybe yes. our guy, Mr. Clovins, yeah, no one's heard of him and he was probably playing against Yusupov and thought, oh, this is my big game. I need to not lose. So, um, <laughs> okay, we still have time to look at another game. I don't know why we're starting here and spoiling all the answers. 
But okay, this is black to play. I think you guys are probably observant enough to have seen the move that was played. But black needs to try and break up this white center. If we look, these pawns, the hanging pawns, are giving white that space advantage. And black is very cramped. These two knights are not ideally where they would want to be, which is why he looks for counterplay of b5, which, okay, is a very dynamic approach. We looked at the e pawn break. Yeah, we're seeing the b pawn break, which very similar ideas. And okay, you see this a lot in like your hedgehogs, some of your bononis and that, and especially your Maroxy binds. And anytime black can get this break in and it's not terrible, it's usually very good for him. White captured on b5, black captured back, white pushed c4 to keep that sweet space advantage. We got knight into c4 and rook to a2. What should black do? Yeah, where should we move the queen? Queen B8. Queen B. Because I mean, there's not many pretty. I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking a couple of things. Well, my first reaction is to play Queen to C8. I think. Okay. Um, however, I'm contemplating uh, Queen takes A2 followed by Knight takes um, E3, and then uh, after White moves the Rook, you can take the 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 D pawn, and is that I don't know if that's enough compensation. Well, it's a rook and a minor piece for the queen, but I'd, you know, is it? Yeah, you're trying to work out if it's practically working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I I don't know if. Yeah, it needs to be yeah. calculated. You can't say in like mm. two seconds, right? So at least we're on the right track. I don't know. I don't know if it's too much of a difference between queen b8 and queen c8. I'd prefer queen c8 because I feel like it doesn't block our knight and things. Maybe it allows black white to bring his rook in which might have been white time uh, i decided to play in the eight just because if uh, my rook on c7 does move i got that whole file no the reason the reason i changed my ideas from moving the queen is purely because black just takes your b pawn oh well he's gonna you know, take, you take the bishop at one point yeah no no but at some point you're taking that b pawn you, you which yeah, after black def after white defends himself like how like it's mm. you he went from uh you went from a weak he, white went from a weak pawn structure to black having the weaker pawn structure mm. so that makes that is a very sense. interesting explanation of it which okay i'm not sure if queen b8 or queen c8 there's some technicalities as we have on the screen yeah there's a thread of a pin so maybe queen c8 is the better way of doing it but it's still unpleasant the b pawn is clearly a weakness and black's pieces are quite badly placed which yeah. i presume yusupov did calculate this queen sack ahead of time dot the queen takes knight takes i think he played a yeah he did yeah. That. I don't know if I'd call it a sacrifice because it is a rook and a minor piece for a queen, which is generally yeah, and you get equal. the pawn, so you're not even losing mm. any points value. I don't know. I still always would think of it as a sacrifice because you're playing with it's a material imbalance. So like even yes. if I would exchange say a rook for like a bishop and two pawns, sure it's the same, but I'll still think in my head, oh, it's a sacrifice. Which I got. I don't know if that's the right way of thinking about it. Your way sounds more correct, like all the fancy grandmasters. Oh, uh, it's just you get compensation. I remember I was watching, I think it was Napomniachi or something the one time. He sacked the piece and he was like, Oh, I didn't sack a piece. I removed like half his defenders or something. And you had like sacked it for a pawn. <laughs> and he was convinced he didn't sacrifice anything because he thought, Okay, there's less defenders now, which I okay, guess <laughs> an interesting mindset to have. Which, yeah. yeah. So the problem is we've now picked up a knight. What we picked up a bishop, a rook, and a pawn, and this pawn is now weak, and we have the counterplay on the king. So it's kind of those extra bonus items that make it very strong for black here. Yeah. So I'll play this 
Mm -hmm. I'll play this in like a like a rapid game, but I won't play this in like a classical. I don't. Everyone always says that like oh, it's you. But like I feel like classical, you can actually calculate everything better. Yeah, I, I was gonna say the opposite way. I would be. I'd play. End up playing passively in a rapid or blitz. So my queen's attack, move my queen. In a classical, I have time to consider these. Like okay, wait, I'm gonna take the D pawn. I'm going to eventually take the C pawn. He has to move his king. Like, you know, I, I now have the, the E5 square for my knight, like, I, and I can play rook to A8 to attack his queen. I, th I think I've got enough compensation. And even bishop D5 forcing that queen to make some choices. Yeah, yeah there's a yeah. lot of nice options here. Like, I think if you could calculate so, so, this accurately in your head to here in a rapid game, you're 100% play this. Like, yeah, but I wouldn't be able to do it in a rapid game. <laughs> in a classical game, I feel like yeah, I, there are more chances of me sacrificing my queen in a in a classical than I'd ever do in a rapid or blitz. Yeah, yes, but I feel like the good blitz players they just somehow know they just don't calculate. They just they just know. I don't know how. <laughs> so they have that gut feeling. If your gut says it's good, it's good. Yeah, and I suppose and that's if, the skill in itself. If you are losing, you play for time. <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah, that's how it goes. Bad. Uh, but yeah, I don't think this was a blitz game. I think it was classical. I don't think it was any funny rapid nonsense because it it feels correct. Like I feel like if I put it on the computer, it's gonna say like plus five or something. Yeah, you, four. I, bishop d five, and then you can go bishop c four. Just pop your bishop into the gaps. Yeah, and then the C pawn's weak, and all your pieces are just in the center of the board that's yeah. great. And you can also play rook a8 and take control of the open file before you move Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. You, know, you, you gain the file, you gain the, the diagonals. That, like, this is really good. It doesn't good. feel like Black's down a queen. <laughs> yeah, no, it is a very nice sacrifice. He continued if knight takes c5, the most boring move he could have played, probably. But knight takes, rook takes, and he's what two pawns, a bishop, and a rook now. He's happy yeah. to just trade these. I presume he has more end game technique than we do, so he's confident in this. I would have looked to get more of an attack going. Knight takes, yeah. I, I thought like that, like the, the c pawn was gonna fall regardless of what happened, so yeah. I mean, I'd rather get the active play first. Yeah. And yeah. this is just a simplified position. Maybe he was able to calculate this ahead of time. I was like, okay, I get this. I'm at least better. So, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Uh, and let's say he has more confidence in the end game than we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. The amount all these strong players worked on their end games, like, it, it's impressive. 91, green takes. Knight takes f3. Now there's all these discovered attacks threatened everywhere. King g2. And it's still kind of tactical because I feel like we should have a discovered attack with our knight, but I don't really see anything. So in the end, he goes. Oh. Hmm? Uh, yeah. I'm more thinking, yeah, I'm more thinking about that because, like, if you imagine the king still still on, on h1 and you have the rook on, on d2, you can just. The okay, uh, Arabian checkmate, they call that yeah. the knight and the yeah. rook combining. But okay, he's forced the, to that upgrade. game we looked on on, on Wednesday. The, that I had that position, that was my end end result. No, yeah. okay, yeah, it's a very nice pattern. King g3, though, and now just knight g5. Really calm move because okay, if the king steps up, he's coming into a mating net. There's a threat of the knight coming here. To e4 and it's just very. I was difficult. thinking of playing knight g5 when the king was still on g2. Yeah. Yeah. So knight knight g5 with the discovered oh. attack. And you're gonna pick up this pawn. Yeah. Which okay, yeah. With probably, I mean, probably with the rook. I mean, this honestly looks even easier. I'm trying to work out why he didn't do yeah. it. Then you just move. If the king can't go. Like the king has to go back. It can't come forward. Yeah, because there's this fork. So, yeah. I think he probably would... I presume he has to have seen this idea. I presume he just felt there's a mating net coming here. Which, okay, I don't know if that's true. Knight d6 gets played, which, okay, apparently... I don't know. Inaccuracy. Yeah, I don't know why there's computer analysis here, and I don't know why it's an inaccuracy, because I feel like he should be losing off to everything. But... <laughs> Apparently, that's the one move they chose. Oh, it's uh, inaccuracy because rook takes knight. And there's a fork, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, yeah like, okay. Then it's but... talk. Yeah. Tactics. Nice tactic. In-game tactics. And okay, Rook and two pieces is definitely better than a queen. Yeah. And now this is better. Yeah, as long as you don't let up a patch. And that's nice technique too. Like, yeah, there's no checks. Everything's defended. Yeah. Very clean. And I think he made him very efficiently too. So that was yeah. a very nice game. Very nice sacrifice. It, it, I don't think it's the most relevant for our like strategical knowledge and that what we've been talking about. But I mean, if I played a game like this, I'd also want to show it to everyone. So, yes. <laughs> which this B5 break is what started it all. I'm curious how how aware he was of the queen sacrifice when he played B5, which okay, I feel like I maybe on a really good day, I spot the idea, but I'm, I feel like I would more want to still bail out of the queen B8 or queen C8. So, I mean, yeah, but yeah, it's a nice game. Yeah, uh, I probably like like if I were in a position like this and played B five and A takes and A takes and then Rook A two, I'd have been like, oh boy, now what do I do? <laughs> I wouldn't have seen it, but when I played B five, I wouldn't have seen yeah. oh Queen takes A two. But in this position, I might consider it. Yeah, you do. I would consider it heavily, definitely. actually. Yeah, I wouldn't play B five and look at and then look at the Queen. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't think, think, yeah. I wouldn't think of that. Yeah, I wouldn't have seen it from B5, but I probably would definitely I consider would probably it. Seen I don't it know if I'd play it. Push. I don't know if, I'd, if I'm brave enough to play it, especially against a higher rated a player. Mm. Um, I'll play I'll play it against a higher rated player. I won't play it against a lower. <laughs> I will I, I'd probably play it against a lower rated player because I I believe my technique is better than this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but I, but I also like, understand playing against a high rate to play because you want to just yeah, try nothing something else to lose. You, you just you play. play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. It That's how like, I think. Every time I play a higher rated, you have nothing to lose. They they have to attack. We don't. Know. They're the ones scared of you, though, right? Like <laughs> they don't want to lose. So yeah. You know. uh, Especially after like the they don't want to draw either. Hey, I, when I play a high rate to plays and I play a a. a like a dead drawn position, they'll play wild moves because they, they they don't want the draw. There's a reason they're higher rated. They don't get higher rated by drawing against lower rated players. <laughs> so yeah. No, I think so it's bit, also bit, from, bit. just like with this quarantine, everything everyone has like has spent a year on their yeah. chair. But everyone's gotten like significantly better. Yeah, I'm just out here donating rating points whenever I play. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> Great, but I get. Let's go through this last game quickly. We do still have a few yeah. minutes, so I want to jump through most of the opening. They do play another Nimzo, no, very similar. Yeah, they play d5 in one move instead of doing some very big brain d6 and then d5 ideas. Castles d takes c4, bishop takes c4, cd4, ed4. We see this isolated pawn. A lot of your isolated pawns do turn into hanging pawns positions after this bishop takes c3, yeah. b6, bishop g5, bishop b7, queen e2, get bishop takes c3, as I mentioned, bishop takes c3, knight bd7, bishop d3, and queen c7. So, okay, we see the first stages of us wanting to target these central pawns c4 is played so the bishop is protecting it and now we need a move for black because okay obviously rook d8 and rook c8 are very natural ideas he plays a very interesting move here can you guys come up with some ideas bit of sacrifice in the queen queen takes h2 yes in memory I can't not just play h2 now. Knight g4. Knight g4. This guy's playing like a grandmaster. That was always played. It's looking at the idea that white often will exchange here and try to launch some attack. So knight g4 avoids that exchange. It prepares advancing here as well. Yeah. But, but why, why about just playing h3? If you just play h3... What? Knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, and then you have the Oh, yeah, and then you have the mate. Okay, fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. this fair is enough. the whole dream. Okay, we all see this if we're playing a blitz game and we're looking for tricks. 
but yeah, uh, this, that is an important detail. And this idea of e5. Bishop e4 is played to nullify that whole diagonal. Bishop takes e4, queen takes e4, and the knight just comes back to f6. With the light sweat, bishop's gone. Now black isn't scared of getting checkmated. He's traded enough pieces. The queen yeah. comes back to e2, and now he just starts playing normal chess. That whole maneuver was just because he was slightly scared. Now he's happy to just uh, put pressure on the pawns. Rook to c1, queen to b7, queen b2, queen a6, queen b3, rook c6. He's just going to double up on the c pawn. Rook to c2. Mm. White is also forced to kind of double up on the c pawn. And in most of these positions where the side of outdanging pawns can trade off enough pieces that he can't get checkmated, he's at the very least not going to lose. And he can try to play for an advantage. Like, here, yeah. h6. Now he's chasing the bishop away. Bishop f4. <coughs> Queen to a5. We've, I think we saw in the previous position, was it the previous game? The one before the queen sacrifice game. Yeah. Was hovering around these squares, restricting the pawn's advance from the side. We get the same plan here. Bishop comes back to d2, again harassing the queen. The queen comes to f5, getting maybe even more active. Now white yeah. feels like he has to do something, so he goes d5. It feels like white is getting a bit desperate and trying to force things a bit quickly. Knight c5 is played, which okay is a very nice tactic, kind of pulling an escom, cutting the electricity between the rooks. <laughs> Queen and yes. three. Rook d6, knight d4, and queen to d3. And black's queen gets right into the heart of all of white's pieces. We get knight to c6, rook to d7, and knight e5. White does get this wannabe fork, but all it does is force a queen trade. And we have a weird position because it feels like white should be better. White's pieces are more active, but he's left with pawn weaknesses. If he takes on e3 and we take back, you can argue that the c pawn is more weaker than the e pawn, which yeah. it's a complicated position still. Rook d1 is played, knight d7. Wanting to trade even more pieces. White brings the knight back to c6. And okay, that knight cannot be allowed to stay. So knight b8. Just continually harassing the knight. Knight takes b8. Rook takes b8. Bishop d4 with a large mistake symbol. Why is bishop d4 wrong? Because of um, knight takes d5. I feel like you can't like miss knight takes d5. Was he think thinking? Uh, I was looking at e4? takes first. <laughs> Maybe he thought this was knight. annoying. Because like I don't know how you miss that as a grandmaster, right? How do you miss that? If it, this is just a time pressure. Game. Yeah, maybe it's time yeah. pressure. Maybe this is a rapid game, but the, you can't miss this as a grandmaster with time on your plan. even as a classical game. I mean, like they, they they did play a very complicated game. They could have been under a lot of time pressure. I mean, okay, I watch like the candidates and people like Grishuk, they just get in time pressure after 10 moves. So like who knows what yeah. these people are doing. So yeah, that, that's an unfortunate miss. White Bishop, I don't think Bishop can often knight takes ball and Bishop goes to E. Yeah, I think you can just like play B B6 now. B7. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And it doesn't really do anything. I was yeah. trying to see if he maybe like miscalculated something or but it doesn't appear that way. It looks like he just straight up missed it. They do give yeah, another way just... where taking on e6 is the right way to do it and then pushing the pawn and trying to liquidate as much as he can. But even though it's like, it's, it's not what you want to be doing, these operations with this pin on your rook still. So it's not natural. But okay, this bishop d4 was what happened in the game. Hanging. But it, it's a, like, sometimes it does make sense. Like if your rook was protected the whole game and then you, you, believe it's still protected when you play a move like that yeah because he did play this rook d1 move but but still you're a grandmaster that you're better than this <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it, it's unfortunate because okay and as i've mentioned a few times the moment you lose one of the hanging pawns the other one's isolated and you've lost all your counterplay uh we saw in another game the guy just sacked an exchange rather than be down the one pawn these yeah. positions you can be down with pawns. A4, yeah. B7, 
rook c6 and okay then we won't look at the end of the game but black is clearly better the rooks coming here i don't know if you want to try some nonsense like this but there's enough counterplay for black okay let's quickly look at our cheat sheet again so we looked at our plans when we we're playing with the hanging pawns we have this idea of breaking through of d4 d5 we have the idea of pushing c4 c5 and playing against the weak b pawn or just restricting the opponent's pieces we looked at the idea of throwing the a pawn of course all the grandmasters are doing this these days throwing the a and h pawns and we looked at attacking with the F1, which okay, that can be applied in a lot of situations just to strengthen your attack. We want to keep pieces on the board. We want to keep control of the center. We want to defend our hanging pawns, as we saw in this game. If you lose a pawn, it's basically game over. And then we will want to look to exploit all our dynamic possibilities and ideas. If we're playing against the pawns, it's the inverse of that. Our plans are to put pressure on the center that stops the advances it ties up our opponent's pieces we want to look to play the pawn breaks with the e pawn or the b pawn and disrupt the center and if we can play a brilliant queen sacrifice but yeah <laughs> we also want to okay exchange our opponent's active pieces these are just good rules of chess we want to provoke them into a premature advance we want to control the center and then fianchettering your bishop is often an idea because of your bishops on e3 or d3, it's always vulnerable to pawn pushes with tempo. Okay, I think we are done for this evening. I hope it was instructive and you guys got something out of it. It was no, very good, rushed, thank you. So I apologize I if I lack knowledge in certain times, but yeah, that's everything from my end.